Good morning. Welcome to the Weintraub Tobin Corporate Transparency Act uh, webinar overview for you today. Um, this is uh, being put on for clients of Weintraub Tobin. Um, our two presenters today are myself. I'm Jeannie Vance. I am a partner in the corporate department. I practice exclusively in the healthcare industry, and I um, started, I, I became uh, the one sort of spearheading a lot of these issues over here because in healthcare, we have a lot of government disclosure similar to what um, is is now uh, applicable to, to businesses um, across the board. And um, so, and I'm located here in Sacramento. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Andrews Bostrom. I'm one of the associates in the corporate department also located here in Sacramento and have the pleasure of actually sharing a wall with Jeannie. Yeah. Um, very close. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've been also tasked by the firm to kind of get my head around these new regulations and work closely with Jeannie and making sure we understood uh, what this is all about so that we can, uh, uh, oh, I'm seeing a, a note that I'm pretty hard to hear. So let me go ahead and I'm going to adjust my microphone here pretty quick. All right. I'll talk while you're doing that, Anders. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so a disclaimer about the webinar today, and that is uh, the purpose of today's uh, webinar is to provide a free service um, to our clients, um, which is to give a, a broad overview of the Corporate Transparency Act the analyses um, as it applies to any particular organization or cluster of organizations is highly fact specific. And so it's unlikely that you'll get everything you need, you know, out of this webinar, but it, it should give you sort of a, a, a broad um, familiarity with the issues sufficient enough to know if you need to ask uh, additional questions, et cetera. Uh, if you have questions as we go through the webinar, go ahead and put them in the chat feature. And um, and then uh, time permitting, I mean, I'm certain that we will answer some, at least some of the questions, maybe all of them um, as we as we go through. Uh, but hey Jeannie, we'll this is Mary. I'm just gonna jump in for a minute. We The chat feature is actually disabled, but people can put it in Q&A, which gotcha. is a, a separate button. And we do have a raised hand um, from one of the guests, but I, wonder if, if that's a technical issue, um, maybe you could put that in Q&A and then we can take questions at the end. Great, thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. So what, here's a, a, a overview of what we're intending to cover today. So the, the first thing is to provide some background on what was the intention and the purposes behind the Corporate Transparency Act and also to provide some um, information on what has come out in recently published final rules. We'll talk about the effective dates and when um, your organization might need to be worried about deadlines for reporting. We'll talk about who are reporting companies and what uh, exclusions there are. There are lots of exclusions uh, uh, applicable, some of which we'll talk about here. Uh, what is required to be reported uh, under the, the CTA um, are beneficial owners and company applicants. And so we'll talk about what each one of those are. Uh, in addition, uh, there are update reports that are required. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about what happens if a company violates the reporting obligations. And then we'll talk about how we here at Weintraub Tobin are handling CTA matters and how you might be able to access those services if you need to. Uh, and then finally, we'll go into questions and answers. First is uh, some background on the Corporate Transparency Act and um, updates on the recently published final rules. So the Corporate Transparency Act uh, is, a, is a law enforcement tool uh, that requires uh, reporting companies to submit reports to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which we call FinCEN. And that requires that certain personal information about beneficial owners and applicants be reported to this federal law enforcement agency. A reporting company is any domestic corporation, limited liability company, or similar entity, or 
any foreign entity outside of the United States that registers to do business in the United States. There are lots of exceptions that apply uh, for companies that are already regulated at the federal or state level and for large companies uh, with a, that have a U.S. operating location. A beneficial owner is uh, any individual who has a 25% ownership interest or greater or who exercises substantial control. A company applicant, which is a, another person that has to be reported within the FinCEN reports, is a person that files a document to form or register a company. FinCEN is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is part of the United States Department of the Treasury. Its mission is to safeguard the financial system. Uh, it combats money laundering, it promotes national security through um, uh, managing and collecting data, financial intelligence, and strategic use of financial authorities. The, the idea behind this was to get at um, you know, foreign interference in um, American systems and money laundering. The FinCEN final rule has some underlying policies behind uh, the rules that it adopted. Uh, it targets small, smaller companies that were um, you know, previously unregulated for the most part, um, that so that those companies were no longer were not previously subject to beneficial owner reporting requirements. And then there are exceptions to reporting requirements for larger companies. And we'll talk about how large you have to be in a bit. <laughs> Broad application, the, the final rules have uh, make the FinCEN rules, the CTA rules apply broadly. They're tend, intended to bring in as many companies as possible within the reporting requirements. And it, the rules are drafted to promote law enforcement interests and not necessarily to minimize the burdens on reporting companies, beneficial owners, and applicants. The exceptions remain very narrowly limited. They are intended to apply to the very narrowest subset permitted by the law, and again, designed to promote the interests of law enforcement. All right, there are a variety of effective dates that are applicable depending on, upon when the legal entity that is being analyzed was formed. So well, first I'll talk about existing reporting companies and what those are are entities that were created before January 1st, 2024 of this year or foreign reporting companies that register to do business in the United States prior to January 1st, 2024. So we're calling those existing reporting companies. For that cluster of companies, the initial report with FinCEN, assuming that it applies to your organization, must be filed with FinCEN no later than January 1st, 2025. So you've got the rest of this year uh, to either file those reports or collect the data with an eye towards um, you know, complying with that date. All right, so for new reporting companies formed during the 2024 calendar year or foreign reporting companies that are first registered in the United States to do business during the 2024 calendar year, those companies must file uh, their initial report within 90 days after the date that the reporting company receives actual notice that that company was created or registered in the United States. And, and the reason it's written that way, you could say, um, you know, 90 days after you were formed. But I know that when we um, we form organizations here at Weintraub Tobin and and anyway, anywhere, if, if you're forming any of those in-house, You'll file your articles with the Secretary of State, and um, you know they may act on it, but it may take a while for them to notify you, or it might take a little bit of time for it to appear in the public record in the database that's available online. So the triggering date would be that date that it was either first available online, so you were notified of that, or um, the date that you otherwise got notice from the Secretary of State. So it's not actually triggered off the formation date. The alternative date uh, is, yes, so um, on to the next slide. 
Okay, so if there is a new reporting company that's formed on or after January 1st, 2025, either foreign or domestic, the deadline is 30 days after whichever of those triggering dates are that I just talked about. The company receives a notice that they've been formed or um, you, know, you have either public information or personal information from the Secretary of State that your registration or, or your formation has been accomplished. So the idea is you, know, you have one set of deadlines for companies formed prior to January 1st, 2024, which is the end of this year. For this one calendar year, they're giving people 90 days to um, comply with uh, these FinCEN reports, knowing that this is a new requirement and they're having a bit of grace on all of us. But then after this year, then you have only the 30 day period to uh, get the FinCEN reports filed. Next, I'll talk about what are who are reporting companies and what exclusions are there to being a reporting company. A reporting company under the CTA means a corporation, LLC, or similar entity that's created by the filing of a document with the Secretary of State or similar office of a state or American Indian tribe, or a reporting company uh, under the CTA means one of those kinds of entities that were formed under the law of a foreign country and registered to do business in the United States by filing a document with the Secretary of State or similar office of a state or American Indian tribe. I've given you the citation in case anybody would like a little light reading. And then it says, or similar entity to those things. So that would include a, a, an entity formed by the filing of a document with a state or an American Indian tribe. Uh, I've given you the citation for a list of all of the exemptions of when you would, could be exempt from uh, the CTA uh, FinCEN filing requirements. There are 23 of them. It generally applies to uh, very regulated businesses, but I will tell anybody that's on here that's one of my lovely healthcare clients that that does not include the heavily regulated entities in healthcare, um, but there are some others that it does apply to. Uh, examples of regulated entities that are not reporting companies are uh, financial in institutions, uh, public utilities, companies subject to the Securities and Exchange Commission regulation, And then there's something called large operating companies, which I expect might apply to um, you know some of our company, or some of our clients here at Weintraub Tobin, which are uh, an entity that has more than 20 employees, has a U.S. income tax re return for the previous year showing at least five million dollars in gross receipts, and have an operating presence at a physical office in the United States. Um, but you could certainly be a larger company, but not satisfy all of those elements. And so um, so there we go. I will mention also, I know we had a pre-question in uh, the registration about um, entities that file consolidated um, tax returns. So if there's a cluster of entities, there is an exemption that it's not on the slide for subsidiaries of exempt companies. And um, that's not necessarily the same standard as what is required for consolidated financials, which I know, you know can vary depending upon your um, accountant, et cetera. Um, but that might be a possibility for you to explore um, you know, with, with your attorney. So under the large operating uh, company exemption, uh, you have to have these 20 or more um, full-time employees. They don't say exactly what constitutes an employee. Probably a lot of you are familiar that there are various standards for what constitutes a, an employee. Um, they, FinCEN looks to the IRS definition for what is a full-time employee. Uh, and, and the IRS provides that a full-time employee averages 30 hours per week or 130 hours per month. Relative to the $5 million in gross receipts requirement of the large operating company exemption, that means gross receipts from U.S. income. 
and those must be actually reported on the entity's applicable IRS form, excluding amounts from sources outside the United States. In terms of the operating presence at a physical office within the United States, that, that physical office must be owned or leased by the company and it cannot be a residence or a shared space except for certain affiliates with which you may be able to share space. Great. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, I wanted to one, hopefully again, my microphone volume is a little better, uh, but I wanted to also um, touch base because we've received a question a, a few times already from some of our clients that uh, those 20 employees for the large operating company exemption, that is for a single entity. So if you're looking, if you're aggregate, you cannot aggregate across multiple entities to try to hit that 20 employee level. It is per entity. Um, but on our next topic, um, one thing that is very prevalent within the CTA is you have to report the personal information of a company's or reporting company's beneficial owners. So who are these beneficial owners, who qualifies as a beneficial owner. And that's what I want to talk about next. So beneficial owner means any individual who directly or indirectly own or either exercises substantial control over the reporting company or owns or controls 25% or more of the ownership interests of the reporting company. We're going to go a little bit more into detail on, on what that means. So first for substantial control. So who would be exercising substantial control? Um, and these, again, are examples. It's not an exhaustive list, but an individual who exercises substantial control over a reporting company, if the, if the individual does any of the following. So serves as a senior officer of the reporting company. So any of your C-suite staff um, has the authority to appoint or remove a senior officer or the majority of a reporting company's board of directors or a similar body could be a board of managers for an LLC, et cetera. Directs, determines, or has substantial influence over important decisions made by the reporting company whether to incur substantial debt, whether there's a veto right or a right to sell all or substantially all of the assets. Those are some that would be substantial or qualify as substantial influence or has any other form of substantial control over the reporting company. So really you have this broad, um, this, this broad category that's, that's mainly intended to um, require as as many people reporting as possible um, for those who have substantial control. FinCEN has made it known that um, while not every company would have a beneficial owner as far as direct or indirect ownership of that 25% threshold, they do expect that every reporting company would have someone qualifying as, as a person with substantial control um, for the company. Some examples um, include board representation. If you're a director on a board, um, that could qualify as substantial control. We're not, um, it's it, to be clear that that's not determinative by itself. Uh, the board member would have to have uh, the ability to exercise that substantial control, um, but that could be a, an important factor to look at, look at. Another example is owning or controlling a majority of the voting power or voting rights of the reporting company. Another example, rights associated with any financing arrangement or interest in the reporting company, um, whether or not you can, um, the, the creditor has particular management rights or can exercise that substantial control. 
whether or not someone has control over one or more intermediary entities that separately or collectively exercise substantial control over the reporting company. In that case, if you have, uh, if an individual has control over a, a parent company and that subsidiary as a result of the control over the parent company, that person would also be able to control a subsidiary, then that, the, that, person with a substantial control over the parent company would also qualify as a beneficial owner for the subsidiary. And arrangements or financial or business relationships, formal or informal, with other individuals or entities acting as nominees. So whether or not you have someone acting as your agent on behalf of the company, that you have a contractual relationship that you can direct or control a company through a nominee or this agent, then you as well would, would qualify. So you can't avoid this simply by having a private contract with somebody kind of to step in your shoes and controlling the company. And then finally, there's a broad um, kind of default rule as well that whether there's any other contract arrangement, understanding relationship or other exercise of control. Um, so it is meant to be drafted broadly. So for ownership interest, the final reporting rule defines ownership interest broadly uh, to include the following, regardless of whether the interest is transferable, classified as stock or similar, or converse voting powers or rights. So this can be equity, stock, or a similar interest instrument, um, any capital or profit interest in, in an entity. Um, so if you uh, receive a substantial profit interest, but don't necessarily own the stock per se of an entity, you still qualify as an owner. Uh, an instrument convertible to equity or stock interest. We have uh, convertible promissory notes that we frequently see in our business. And as long as you can convert those notes to equity or stock um, at your uh, election and that that rest that right is a current right, then that would also qualify. Uh, you would also qualify as an owner. Um, as well, there's option or privilege to buy or sell any of the interests in a reporting company, even if you do not have an obligation to do so. And then also any other instrument, contract, arrangement, understanding, relationship, or mechanism used to establish ownership. So ownership interests also include, and here's some examples, any capital or profits interest in an entity, any instrument that is convertible with or without consideration into any share of uh, instrument described in the previous slide or any future on such instrument, whether characterized as debt or not. Often debt agreements are characterized debt as debt for preference, but include many um, ownership rights in the company as well. Just characterizing something as debt would not be determinative of whether or not you're a beneficial owner. Any warrants or right to purchase, we talked about warrants are similar to options. And if you can exercise uh, your right and elect to purchase stock or equity, then even with that right to purchase, you would qualify as a beneficial owner. And then again, we have our catch all. So an individual may directly or indirectly own or control an ownership interest through a contract arrangement, understanding relationship or otherwise, including joint ownership with one or more persons. So similar to substantial control, you can't have a third party interacting on your behalf with a company and avoid um, reporting uh, your personal information as a beneficial owner for a reporting company. So here's a common example and one of the more interesting um, situations that come up is whether the whether a trustee or a beneficiary needs to report based on the interest or equity being of a company and a reporting company being held in trust. And FinCEN has given a few examples in this area um, and states that the following individuals, if the ownership interest is held through a trust, 
qualifies as a beneficial owner. So a trustee can qualify as a beneficial owner or any other individual having authority to dispose of trust assets. A beneficiary can qualify as a beneficial owner um, if that beneficiary is the sole permissible recipient of the trust income or principal or has the right to, de to demand a distribution of or withdraw substantially all of the trust assets. So if that beneficiary has a vested right in the trust assets, then at that time, that person would also be a beneficial owner. As well, if a grantor or settler of the trust uh, can revoke the trust and withdraw those trust assets. So simply because it's held in trust, if it's a revocable trust at any time, then that grantor or settler would also qualify as a beneficial owner. Okay, so how do we meet this 25% ownership threshold? Um, so as, as mentioned before, this 25% is, is an aggregate of whether it's directly or indirectly uh, owned. So it's a calculation you have to go through. Um, and this is where we recommend uh, consulting definitely with your attorney to determine both on a substantial control uh, basis to determine who has that substantial control as it can often determine is uh, based on the contractual rights an operating agreement, the bylaws, um, but also for those who own multiple shares through different entities, it's an aggregate of that ownership uh, for the beneficial owners and whether that individual um, can clearly and whether it, uh, a decision can be made by the company that that person meets that 25% ownership threshold. So the ownership percentage, percentage is, is to be calculated as a percentage of the total outstanding ownership interests of the reporting company and at the present time um, with any options or similar interests being treated as exercised. Um, so, at, and this includes whether that ownership is you know, what that ownership is at the time that the report is being made. So you uh, assume that any rights that you have to exercise to uh, to increase your ownership uh, threshold has, has been exercised as we talked about, you know, those convertible debts, uh, options, warrants, and you aggregate your ownership total as of the time of the report. And so we talked about there, there is a reasonable certainty. Uh, we'll, we'll call it a, a safe harbor um, in this case, uh, where if the reporting company cannot make these calculations with reasonable certainty, um, well, 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 on the flip side, if the, if the reporting company can make with reasonable certainty that an owner uh, or an individual owning or controlling that 25% or more of any class or type of ownership of a reporting company, um, then that person is deemed a beneficial owner. But there is that reasonable certainty uh, requirement there. But you're supposed to, if you're, if you're close to the line, you're supposed to default on uh, the side of reporting. Okay, exclusions from who who is excluded by FinCEN um, as being a beneficial owner. So in this case is a minor child. Uh, if the minor child holds stock, then the parent or guardian um, would report under the CTA. The minor child does not have to report its personal information. A nominee, if somebody's acting simply as an intermediary, a custodian or agent on behalf of another individual, that person is exempt and is excluded from being a beneficial owner. Employees are also excluded if the control that they have is derived solely from that person's employment status. Now, it's important to know that that's the economic benefit or control. Um, again, somebody who is 
a manager or is an officer would still qualify as, as a substantial controller of the business and need to be disclosed. A uh, person with a right of inheritance, when that right has not vested. So just because somebody is a beneficiary, and if you remember a couple slides back, we talked about that, um, that right to either make distributions or require the distributions of the trust that needs to have, be a vested interest, it needs to be current. So simply being a beneficiary or having a right of inheritance does not qualify somebody as a beneficial owner. And also if you're a creditor, um, simply being a creditor does not necessarily qualify you as a beneficial owner. However, if through the uh, debt agreements you have with a company, you can exercise substantial control, it's possible that as a creditor, you could still be a beneficial owner. However, your status as a creditor is not determinative. Okay, Jeannie, I'll turn it over to you. So in addition to the beneficial owners, the other party that has to be reported or parties in the FinCEN reports is the company applicants. So I will talk about what that means. Uh, the CTA re requires the reporting of applicant information in general. It's the same content that is required for the beneficial owners. An applicant is a math maximum of two individuals who either, uh, either they are the ones who actually file the application or the document to form the corporation, LLC, or similar entity, uh, or they file a document to register or apply to register a corporation. LLC or similar entity that is a foreign uh, entity doing business in the United States. So for a domestic reporting company, that's the going to be the person that actually files the document that creates the, the company or the person for a foreign company, the person that actually files the document that registers the foreign uh, reporting company. And for either one, it's going to be the individual who is primarily responsible for directing or controlling such filing if more than one individual uh, is involved in the filing of the document. So what that will mean is if we here at Weintraub Tobin are forming your entity for you, then it would be someone from here, an attorney from here, whose information would be identified as your company applicant. And in addition, uh, if we were to use uh, a, an outside service, which we sometimes will do, we'll prepare the documents and then we send it to a company that then files it, then that company uh, would have to have some information. Uh, you'd have to have some information about the person that is uh, working on it over there at, um, for example, Parasec is, is a company that we use sometimes. Um, so those entities would be reporting. If you are a company that has maybe a legal office and you have a paralegal that is doing all of your entity formations, your paralegal is going to be uh, one of the company applicants. So uh, he or she would need to have his or her information um, in these FinCEN reports and the reporting company would be responsible to collect that information and then file it within the FinCEN reports. Back to Anders. Thanks, Gina. I've been trying to, to respond to some of your answers uh, or some of the questions. Um, bear with us. We'll try to get to that as the end as much as possible as well. Um, but for the reporting requirements of a business, so how does a reporting company who, once you've identified yourself, as you don't, you do not have a qualifying exemption, um, and how, how do you go about making, making your report? So the company, it, it's important to note that it once, if a company is able to identify that it qualifies for an exemption, you do not need to report to FinCEN, um, that you are exempt. The reporting requirement, um, you, you will need to report if you, if you filed an initial uh, CTA report with FinCEN and then subsequently qualify for an exemption, you will need to update your report simply stating that you are now exempt. Um, however, if you have always 
been exempt and have not had to file a uh, beneficial ownership information report, then you do not need to, to do anything at this point. Um, also note, um, we've received some questions that if you qualify as a 501c3 uh, nonprofit, then, then that is also um, exempt. Uh, however, I would just be belabor the point to, to make sure that you do a proper analysis to make sure that you qualify as well. Um, because yeah, simply not, being yeah. a nonprofit. I'm going to just jump in and say not all nonprofits are exempt. So yeah. you'll you'll want to you'll want to um, circle back with your uh, attorney. Correct. Yeah. Um, also, if a company filed its beneficial, oh, as mentioned, um, you you will need to update your BOI report um, for exemption. Um, and also, if if there's any change, and we'll go over that um, subsequently, but if you have any change in the information that you have previously filed, then that triggers a new 30-day requirement to update your BOI report. So it's an ongoing um, requirement that you maintain the information uh, current and accurate with FinCEN. So what information needs to be reported? Uh, for the reporting company, the, uh, the reporting company needs to provide its full legal name, any trade names, fictitious names, DBAs, regardless of whether the name is being registered, um, the street address of the principal place of business in the U.S., um, so where it's registered to do business. If it's a foreign entity, um, and it's registered to do business in the U.S., it will need to already have a registered office in the U.S., and so that will need to be provided. Um, the jurisdiction of formation, so where the entity was formed, and important to note that every entity will need to provide a taxpayer identification number. That can also be an EIN or employer identification number um, provided. So within that time frame. Um, so one of our examples, we talked about new uh, new entity being formed within this year, um, a new entity being uh, who who has been formed has that 90 days both to obtain a taxpayer identification number and to submit that report. So that needs to be included within a company's uh, report. And important to note that can also be that taxpayer identification number can also be a foreign taxpayer identification number. So what what information does a beneficial owner need to provide? Uh, the information is that a full legal name of each beneficial owner of the company, that beneficial owner's date of birth, their current residential address, and a unique identifying number from certain government documents with a photo of the individual. So for example, driver's license or a passport, as well as you need to upload a image of that government document. So some expect acceptable sources of that unique identifying number as we stated, um, and this is important, it must be non-expired at the time of submission. As Unless you are resubmitting for a different entity or um, needing to update that uh, unique identifying number, then at that point, you don't, once your, let's say your driver's license expires, you don't have to resubmit an image of your driver's license unless you're doing a, a, a second or unique report. Um, however, when during your initial report, it does need to be a non-expired um, government ID, and that can be, again, a passport, a state-issued ID, a driver's license, or a foreign passport. I'm going to jump back in, and I jumped the gun in my speaking, and so I've covered a lot of this content already, so I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly. So for uh, reporting companies that... Um, 
are in, were in existence before January 21st, 2024, that the reporting company's FinCEN report does not need to include the company applicant information because you'd be looking back <laughs> to who was involved when you actually were form forming the company. But uh, you will have to provide it for reporting companies formed or registered on or after uh, January 1st, 2024. Uh, The information required for uh, company applicants is virtually identical to what is required for beneficial owners. So here is the list for your um, reference. With respect to the address for the, a company applicant, if the company applicant filed the formation or registration document in the course of the company's ap company applicant's business, then the street address of the business must be reported. In all other cases, the report, reporting company must provide the residential street address for the company applicant. This, these next couple slides talk about um, the detail that I provided earlier about who are your company applicants. A company applicant who is an employee of the service company or the law firm uh, must either provide their sensitive personal information to every reporting company for which they filed formation or registration documents uh, with which they have no direct relationship, or those individuals could obtain a FinCEN identifier and be under a perpetual obligation to update their applicant information. Because in that case, the, the reporting company simply includes the FinCEN identifier as opposed to all that detail of information. But then you, you know, if it's me who has the FinCEN number, then I'm under an obligation that if I move, for example, that I have to update my residential street address with FinCEN. Providing a business address for the company applicant does not protect the individual's residential address from disclosure. Uh, although the disclosures are limited, this information does not become public information and Anders will provide some additional detail about that in a moment. Okay, so certification. Um, and in this case, it's when filing a report so the person filing on behalf of a reporting company, um, what sort of certification do they need to provide? Um, so the, the person filing needs to certify that they, first, that they have the authority from the reporting company to file the BOI report. So whether or not you engage um, an attorney or us to file on your behalf, or a there are uh, multiple filing companies as well um, that will file the information on your behalf, those files have to certify they, they have the authority to, to make the report. Also, the filer on behalf of the reporting company needs to certify that the information provided is true and correct and complete. Again, the filer, who often will be an individual or a third party, um, is making this certification on behalf of the reporting company. That individual does not have an obligation to do its own due diligence to certify that this information is correct as long as the reporting company makes that certification to the filer. Um, this language of certification, and in, in, um, I've gone through the process uh, for FinCEN and you'll just, it's often what you'll see on any sort of software application. You click a little, you check a little box before signing um, and you'll see this information and these certifications being made prior to submitting the report. And this, the language of these certifications is, is pretty consistent with other FinCEN or other certifications required by FinCEN. Um, and it would apply to any report or application uh, for a FinCEN identifier submitted to FinCEN as well. So whether when you have to make those certifications the same if you're applying for a FinCEN ID. Okay, this is an interesting situation. Um, so if you if you are a reporting company and you identify you have your shareholders, 
um, and you reach out to them and you want them to provide the information. So what should a reporting company do if a beneficial owner or company applicant withholds the information that the reporting company is required to provide? Um, so FinCEN recognizes that much of the information required to be reported about beneficial owners um, and the company applicants will be provided to the reporting companies by, by those individuals. Um, but it maintains that the reporting companies are the ones responsible for ensuring that they get this complete and accurate beneficial ownership information to FinCEN. So starting January 1st, the reporting companies have a legal requirement to report that beneficial ownership information to, um, to FinCEN. That means that existing reporting companies uh, should continue to engage their beneficial owners to advise them of this requirement. This is something that you should not wait until, especially for existing companies, don't wait until December to start engaging your beneficial owners to try to get this personal information. Again, it, what's required, you need to have a legal name, the date of birth, current residential address. You need to have a an upload or, or a scanned uh, copy of that the qualifying legal document. I mean, the benefit and these need to be obtained prior to the time that you can make this report and which is required by January 1st, 2025 for existing companies. So continue to engage your beneficial owners um, and do as best as you can to, to follow up with that information with those beneficial owners as a reporting company. Uh, beneficial owners and company applicants also need to be aware, and this can be communicated by the reporting companies or your attorney um, while procuring this information, that applicants or beneficial owners who do not provide the information to the reporting companies can face penalties, both civil and criminal penalties, if they willfully cause a reporting company to fail to report complete or updated beneficial ownership information. So ultimately, while it's the reporting company that maintains the responsibility and the obligation to make this FinCEN report, ultimately, it's the people responsible for uh, causing a company to not file on time or file correct information that can, that can be held responsible. So persons also of note, persons considering creating or registering legal entities that will be reporting companies should take steps to ensure that they have access to the beneficial ownership information required at the time that they are filing or creating these companies. Um, often what we are seeing now and what we are as a law firm are including in uh, governing documents is requirements for all beneficial owners of the company, all shareholders to, that they are required by those documents to provide the necessary information for that company or that legal entity to um, properly file the report. Uh, oftentimes we've also been asked to include consequences if, if we, there's a beneficial owner who, who does not provide that uh, information or willfully withholds that information. What, what sort of consequences even internally would would uh, would occur and that could be forfeiture of that that ownership interest or or uh, other penalties so it's important to note again and I can't stress enough that it's it, to act sooner rather than later to start getting this information first you know contact your attorney um, to determine okay who are my substantial uh, my persons with substantial control, who are my beneficial owners um, that have the qualifying thresholds, who, who do we need to ask in case you have entities um, or trusts with that hold the interest for a company, you know, who do we need to, how do we reach out to them? How, how soon can we reach out to them to get the information from them of who their beneficial owners are? Because that can all trickle down. And ultimately, beneficial owners must be individuals. They are not legal entities. And so if you look up your next tier up and you find that one of your interest holders is an entity, then you'll need the beneficial own ownership information from that entity or a certification from them that they do not have anyone that would trickle down and qualify as a beneficial owner for your unique reporting company's report. 
Hey, Anders, we're yep. running a little short on time. So I'm going to suggest that we skip ahead to slide 41, access to the beneficial uh, ownership information. Um, and that way, uh, everybody's still got the additional content on their slides. Excellent. Um, yeah, and just it's important to update your information. We've kind of already disclosed that. You can refer to the slides um, as it comes in, but we're going to jump right into the access of beneficial ownership information. And this has been a, a question here. Um, Alan, I think this will answer your question. So FinCEN has established a non-public database to secure this personal information that's being gathered or reported under, under the CTA. They're referring to it as the BOSS system or the Beneficial Ownership Secure System. Um, and so who will have access to this? So first, as, as Jeannie mentioned, the primary uh, goal of this CTA is to provide law enforcement, especially federal agencies, uh, with the means to be able to combat money laundering and fraud. Um, so first and foremost are the fe federal agencies engaged in national security, intelligence, and law enforcement. The next tier you have is state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies after authorization by a court of competent jurisdiction. So any subpoena process to be able to get that information. A federal agency on behalf of a non-U.S. law enforcement or foreign prosecutor or judge um, can also uh, get this information or apply to, to gain access to this information. And a financial institution subject to customer due diligence requirements with the consent of the reporting company can also have access. If you've dealt with banks, they often refer to them as KYC requirements or know your customer requirements. It's another uh, regulation that is uh, that is run by FinCEN. And as well, these fin financial institutions uh, do require or will have access. And I just want to quickly note, even Jeannie sent this to me earlier this week, that we even are continually receiving updated guidance. Um, and this one that the uh, for FinCEN reported, it's guidelines for smaller entity financial or smaller financial institutions and how they can access or what can they access. Um, and then just to continue going down the line, federal and state regulators also can have access um, when assessing financial institutions for compliance, and then officers and employees of the Treasury Department for tax administration. All right. Jeannie, I forget, is this... Let's see here. Sure. The, the CTA provides for civil, civil and criminal penalties for violations, including a fine of up to $10,000 or imprisonment for up to two years or both for any person who willfully provides or attempts to provide false or fraudulent beneficial ownership information or who fails to report complete or updated beneficial ownership information to FinCEN. So that's a pretty stiff penalty. Penalties may also apply to reporting companies and individuals who cause a reporting company not to report. So if you're a, one of the people whose who stuff is supposed to get reported into FinCEN and you refuse to provide it, this could be you. Um, or if there are senior officers of a reporting company at the time of its failure to fulfill its obligations to accurately report and update the uh, beneficial ownership information. I'm going to go ahead and skip to um, the Weintraub Tobin corporate CTA compliance efforts and how it's working with us in within the firm. So we have assembled a CTA team um, that is assembled to review, analyze, docket, document, and file FinCEN reports for all new organizational formations and exemption determinations for Weintraub Tobin. On the team are Anders and myself. Um, I'll just say the names because one of these might be your attorney at Weintraub Tobin, Jim Clark, Jeff Peach, Heidi Weinrich. Um, and so uh, these folks are all available to perform CTA analyses and assist with um, FinCEN reporting should you um, request that. So if you are needing help analyzing your 
organization or your cluster of organizations, you can contact your regular Weintraub Tobin attorney to connect with one of these CTA net members. Or if you don't have a Weintraub Tobin attorney, please feel free to reach out directly to a member of the Weintraub CTA team. You can always reach us. Our contact information is on our website. In addition, we have got some uh, CTA um, resources on our website that we um, encourage you to um, avail yourself out, uh, of. And at this point, I think we can uh, turn to questions. Let's see. All right, so here's one. Uh, you know what? I'm going to just pick one out of the chat, and then Anders, why don't you go ahead and do that? Do these requirements apply to single member LLCs? Yes, they could <laughs> apply to single member LLCs. All right, you want to pick one? Yeah, I'll um, jump in. I'm, I'm seeing on some of these that we've already answered some of the information um, through the slides. Um, so I'll go, what's the standard uh, if either substantial control or ownership threshold standards are met by an entity that is itself an exempt entity? So as, as Jeannie mentioned previously, um, if the exempt entity has subsidiary, it has a subsidiary that's also an exempt entity, then, um, then that exemption could, doesn't always, but could trickle down to the subsidiary as well. Um, but in this case, if you have an independent entity that owns, that is exempt, but owns a non-exempt entity, that non-exempt entity would still need to make the report and that the exempt entity, so far as it has any individuals as in part of its ownership structure that qualify for the reporting company as a beneficial owner or a substantial um, a holder of substantial control, they will also need to provide their beneficial ownership information for the reporting company. All right, husband and wife jointly own a 25% interest. Do both of them have to be listed? The answer to that would be yes. Some of the, some of the questions we're getting in the Q&A um, are a little more detailed than what we can really provide in this webinar. <laughs> yeah, and anything that's more client specific, that's why we do want you to reach out uh, or entity specific, we do want you to reach out to your attorney or to uh, anyone as mentioned on the CTA team to do the analysis because sometimes it's uh, it can, whether the exemption analysis, the beneficial ownership or substantial control analysis can, can be pretty, uh, rigorous and, and, and take some questioning um, on that. But I'll jump in. So Paul Thomas said, what is the true purpose of all this? How is our personal information protected? <laughs> um, as, as Jeannie mentioned, the true purpose behind this is, is to combat money laundering um, and fraud and to give those two tools available to law enforcement. Um, also, it, it's to facilitate in other requirements, basically with financial institutions who have requirements to make sure that they're not assisting or um, financing terrorism or other uh, organizations or uh, banned organizations from the United States. They have to know their customers and it helps facilitate that as well. Um, whether that's, you know, the true real purpose of all of this, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to comment on policy agendas or not. Um, but Personal information is protected through that BOSS system. What exactly that means, I think we'll get more information later on. But essentially what we've been told is that it is a secure system where access will only be given um, for those appointed and approved uh, situations. And so that's that's what we can provide at this point. So we are at the end of our time together. I thank you so much for um, joining us today and for being one of our uh, clients. We very much appreciate your business and I hope we hope that you have a, a great rest of your day.